All right. Hello, everyone, and um, welcome to today's Saltzman Book Talk event. Um, I am Karen Yarhimillo. I'm, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a professor in the political science department and SIPA, uh, and I'm also the director of the Saltzman Institute of War and Peace. And I am very excited to have with us today Professor Matthew Crowing in, from the Georgetown um, Department of Government and the Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service. And uh, I'm excited because um, we're going to talk about his uh, brand new book just came out, uh, The Return of Great Power Rivalry, Democracy versus Autocracy from the Ancient World to the US uh, and China. And we're very honored and pleased to have uh, Matt with us today to talk about this exciting book. And I am also uh, grateful for our own uh, Professor Andrew Nathan, who's going to be moderating this book talk. Really, Professor Nathan needs no introduction, but he's the class of 1919 Professor of Political Science at Columbia University, uh, a scholar of Chinese politics and foreign policy, and the author of um, many, um, <laughs> over uh, nine books uh, and many, many articles. And we're very uh, uh, fortunate to have him uh, with us today to moderate the discussion. So um, without um, further ado, I will turn the uh, floor or the Zoom platform to uh, Professor Nathan to introduce uh, 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 Professor Crowing. And um, I just want to say, it's a pleasure to have you all uh, with us today and thank you for taking the time. Uh, we have many events, uh, Saltzman events this semester. Please feel free to register to our listserv if you are not on it already. There are many exciting things coming up the pike and, and would love to see you in all of our events. Um, so thank you very much for being here. Professor Nathan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Karen. So it's great to uh, moderate this session with Matt. He has a wonderful background. He has uh, he's, he teaches at Georgetown, as has been said. He's the author or the editor of seven books. The one before this is the Logic of American Nuclear Strategy. He is also very involved in the policy world. He's been in the Department of Defense and in the intelligence community, and he's been an advisor on some presidential campaigns of Romney, Scott Walker, Marco Rubio. He serves as the director of the Global Strategy Initiative and deputy director of the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security at the Atlantic Council. So he uh, has uh, the ability to write clearly which not all of us have. And so this book that just came out, uh, I have enjoyed very much. It is written in a forceful, clear manner. It's got deep scholarship and it also has deep policy relevance. And so it's an unusually excellent book. We are you know, under a sort of tight time constraint. We can run a little bit over, but we really are targeting just an hour. So. I want to go right to Matt and ask him to introduce the main themes of his book, and then we can go on to discussion from there. Welcome, Matt. Well, thank you very much, Professor Nathan, and thank you very much for those kind uh, remarks on, on the book. And uh, thanks to Karen and Columbia University for hosting me. Uh, it would be great to be there in person uh, with you all, but glad we're able to do this uh, virtually. And um, you know, re really an honor to, to be here with Andrew uh, Nathan, who's been one of the leading scholars on uh, China and Chinese foreign policy for, for many years, and he's certainly uh, influenced my thinking on this issue. Um, so I think what we'd um, discussed was that I would uh, talk about my book for um, 15 minutes or so, and then we'd uh, have, a, have a discussion and Q&A. So, um, you know, as uh, students of international relations know, great power rivalry is something that's happened uh, since the beginning of recorded time, going all the way back to uh, the Greeks and the Persians or Athens and Sparta. Um, but then after the end of the Cold War, we had this kind of remarkable 25 year period where there really wasn't much um, great power competition. Uh, it's hard to believe now, but if you look back at the Obama national security strategy from 2010, uh, never once mentions Russia or China as possible threats. Uh, mentions them as possible 
uh, partners for cooperation and arm, uh, arms control, uh, climate change, issues like that. Um, but then uh, the world's changed quite a bit over the past uh, 10 years. Great power competition has returned, uh, and we've seen Russia and China being more assertive on the global stage. And the 2017 National Security Strategy of the United States of America said that the return of great power competition with China and Russia is the foremost uh, security threat to the United States uh, and its allies. Uh, so a lot of focus on, on this issue now, and, and there's something of a, an emerging uh, conventional wisdom, I think, in Washington and elsewhere that, that maybe Russia and China have the advantage in this competition. Uh, with their autocratic systems, they can be ruthlessly efficient. Uh, they can strategically plan for the long term. Uh, they can pull a lever and, and get things done. Uh, meanwhile, in the United States, our democratic system is too messy. Uh, it's gridlocked, it's polarized, and, and we won't be able to compete. Uh, and I was somewhat um, skeptical uh, of this um, uh, prevailing view, and it's why I was motivated to write the book. And in the book, I argue essentially that actually democracies uh, have built-in advantages in long-run uh, geopolitical competitions, uh, and that um, uh, the United States is actually better suited for this rivalry than either Russia or China. Um, so um, the book, um, I begin with a little bit of uh, theory, uh, like uh, you would expect from a political science book. And I'm not the first person to consider this question. You know, debating is a democratic or autocratic, uh, autocratic constitution better. Uh, is something that goes back, um, scholars have been doing all the way since the time of uh, Aristotle. Um, I talk about Machiavelli in the book, who wrote about this quite a bit. And um, uh, if you know Machiavelli at all, you might be surprised where he came out. He actually argued that Republican systems were better for acquiring wealth and power in the international system. Um, but I really draw more on uh, contemporary social science research. And at Georgetown, one of the courses I teach uh, is an advanced PhD seminar where I really focus on social science research that's been produced in the past um, two decades or so. And for the past two decades or so, social, social, social scientists have been really obsessed by this question of are democracies and autocracies different? And um, there's a growing body of uh, research that suggests that uh, democracies seem to have advantages in certain areas. Um, so economists have written about how democracies have advantages when it comes to long run economic growth. Uh, they have better um, uh, economic institutions. They're better at innovation. Uh, they're better at international finance because people trust uh, investing their monies uh, in democracy, uh, their money in, in democracies. Um, uh, research on uh, possible democratic advantage when it comes to building alliances. Um, democracies seem to have larger, longer lasting, more reliable alliances. You know, just compare NATO to, um, you know, the Warsaw Pact as, as one prominent example. Um, and that democracies might have military uh, advantages, uh, that they make better decisions on war and peace because of the free flow of information. Uh, their leaders can make better decisions and, and basically avoid big, big mistakes. Um, and also democracies don't need to fear their own populations, um, that um, uh, you know, they don't need to repress their own populations so they can focus their military spending and security apparatus on the adversaries abroad, uh, not at home. And so I'm really um, standing on the shoulders of all this research that went before me and kind of said, well, wait a second, if democracies are doing better economically, diplomatically, and militarily, shouldn't they be doing uh, better overall? And so I combine these kind of mid-range theories into a bigger uh, theory about democratic fitness and great power competition. Now, I consider the alternative as well. Do autocracies have certain advantages, like making big, bold decisions without a messy democratic process getting in the way. And, and, and autocracies do have some advantages. I acknowledge that uh, in the book. Um, but that some of these advantages are, are double-edged swords. You know, Making big, bold decisions can be an advantage if it's the right decision. Um, but it also means that autocracies are more likely to make big, bold mistakes. And I talk about you know, both Hitler and um, uh, um, Napoleon invading Russia uh, in, in the winter as, as an example of this. Um, so turning then to the uh, empirical part of the book, uh, I do a little bit of quantitative analysis, and I think that the thing that strikes me there is, you know, democracy has been a relatively rare form of government for much of human history. Uh, yet if you look at the history, especially of Western um, civilization, you see that these democratic countries continually appear um, at the very top of the global pecking order or among the great powers, um, even though they're relatively uh, rare. 
Um, and then I go um, through case studies. So I look at seven case studies of autocratic versus democratic rivals, uh, starting with the Greeks and the Persians 2,500 years ago, all the way up to the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Uh, and um, I, I think we see quite a bit of uh, evidence for the argument uh, of the book. We see these democratic, uh, or, you know, I guess a point on definitions, you know, clearly the uh, ancient uh, Athenians or the Roman Republic wouldn't qualify as democracies according to uh, current definitions. Uh, but I argue that uh, relative more openness uh, to their competitors um, gave them an advantage and, and, and mattered. So, um, uh, you know, it's not black or white democracy or autocracy, but relatively more democratic, relatively more um, autocratic. Uh, but a lot of these democratic um, countries did well for the precise reasons I kind of identify in the book. They were economically innovative. Uh, they were trading powers. They were good at building uh, alliances, uh, built large navies often to support their um, overseas commercial interests and, and became military powers. Um, on the other hand, um, the autocracies tended to do poorly for a lot of the reasons uh, I identified. They were bad at building alliances. They often provoked counterbalancing coalitions against them because of their clumsy diplomacy. Uh, they had financial trouble, um, often uh, defaulting on, on loans. Um, and then militarily, um, their biggest threat came from their own people. So they often uh, had problems with domestic insurrections, coups, civil wars. Uh, and then often made big, bold um, mistakes in, in military affairs. Uh, so that was a really interesting part of the book. I look at some cases that IR scholars don't often look at, uh, the Venetian Republic uh, against the Byzantine Empire, the uh, Dutch Republic against the Spanish Empire. Uh, and actually, after doing the study, I kind of have a new uh, understanding of Western civilization, almost the passing of the torch of these liberal uh, hegemons uh, from one to the other, from Athens to Rome to Venice, uh, to Amsterdam, to London, and then to the current uh, resting place in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, perhaps the most interesting and, and relevant part of the book, though, is um, I focus then on what this means for contemporary uh, international politics and what does it mean for the competition uh, among the United States, Russia, and China. Um, and I think Russia and the United States are fairly easy cases uh, for my argument. Russia um, is debilitated by a lot of these weaknesses we've seen in autocracies. Um, over the years, uh, you know, economically, it's quite weak. Uh, its GDP is um, less than Italy's and Spain's. Uh, we don't think, think about Italy or Spain as, as great powers. Uh, you know, so economically, Russia uh, is not a great power. Um, diplomatically, Russia has uh, challenges. I, um, you know, show that Russia has this bad habit of actually getting into more wars with its allies than with its enemies. Uh, it fought the Nazis when they had an alliance. It fought... Um, uh, China, uh, when they had an alliance, uh, it invaded um, you know, Hungary and Czechoslovakia to Warsaw Pact allies. Uh, and then after the end of the Cold War, it's invaded Ukraine and Georgia, two countries that had been part of this commonwealth of independent states. Um, so, so not a very good way to build alliances um, by, by attacking your allies. Uh, and then Russia has been punching above its weight militarily, but I think it is constrained by its economic um, capacity. And uh, we've seen a decline in Russian military spending. Uh, in the past several years. So I think that's a relatively easy case. I think the United States is uh, also a relatively easy case, although more questions being raised about American strength uh, given recent events, but the United States uh, does still have the world's largest economy, has been the world's innovation leader since the time of Thomas Edison. Um, really um, uh, impressive alliance builder. Um, uh, you know, 30 formal tre treaty allies, other informal partners, uh, roughly 60% of global GDP is within the U.S. Uh, alliance system. Uh, and then the United States has been the world's um, only military superpower for, for many decades. Uh, China's the harder problem. You know, for uh, many years, people thought that maybe China's cracked the code on how to um, uh, make an autocratic system work um, with their kind of state-led capitalist uh, system. And indeed, what China's done over the past several decades has been remarkable. Uh, remarkable economic growth, lifting um, you know, millions, if, if not billions of people, um, uh, or almost a billion uh, uh, people, um, greatly improving their economic circumstances. Um, China is now the second largest economy on earth. Economists predict it could overtake the United States within a decade. Diplomatically, expanding its influence all over the world, including through the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, and then militarily um, investing a lot of its economic capacity into military 
uh, capability. And many U.S. defense planners wonder now, could the United States still defend longstanding partners like Taiwan uh, in the event of a war with uh, China? Uh, so China is certainly a serious competitor, but I argue in the book that I think we already see some of the weaknesses that we've seen in autocracies in the past. Um, President Xi is prioritizing control over economic performance, backtracking on, on promised economic reforms, and we see Chinese economic uh, growth um, uh, declining. Um, uh, some economists now, uh, including uh, Derek Scissors at AEI, are questioning, will China uh, ever become the world's leading economy? Maybe, maybe it uh, will not. Um, diplomatically, I think we see a backlash forming against China because of the heavy-handed diplomacy of President Xi. Uh, the United States uh, waking up to the challenge is good evidence of this, but also the formation of a quad of powers in Asia, uh, India, Japan, the United States, and Australia working together more closely on China. Uh, and even the European Union has now called China a systemic rival. So I think there's a recognition of the challenge from China uh, in the free world that didn't really exist um, just, uh, just a few years ago. Um, and then militarily, I think China has some of the same weaknesses we've seen um, as well. Uh, China spends more on internal security than it does on its military forces. If you uh, follow the money, uh, the CCP is more afraid of protesters in Hong Kong, uh, people in Xinjiang, than it is of the Pentagon. And so that's a significant military advantage for uh, the United States. Um, so adding all of this up, what does it uh, mean? Well, I think first for um, international relations theory, um, you know, international relations scholars are, are really interested in power. And um, in, in some ways, I think I provide the hard power case uh, for democracy in this book. You know, we often value democracy because uh, it protects human rights and individual liberties, and, and those things are important. Um, but in the book, I essentially argue that democracy is the best machine ever invented for generating enormous power and wealth uh, on the global stage. Um, and what does it mean for um, policy and for uh, the future of global affairs? Well, well, I think it means that the United States is in a stronger position than many people appreciate, uh, that the United States, um, despite our many problems, and, and we have uh, our problems to be sure, but I think uh, we're still in a stronger position. Our fundamentals are still better than Russia's and China's, and that the United States uh, is well positioned to be the leading state in the international system for the foreseeable future. Uh, and I actually finish by saying that the real dilemma rests with um, President Xi and President Putin. Um, if they want to continue to hang on to power, uh, then I think that means they'll continue to rule over um, second rate uh, great powers uh, with, with significant um, challenges. Uh, and if they truly want their countries to be global leaders, uh, to be the world's most powerful country, then I think the solution is simple. They need to give up power and put in place the kind of democratic systems that we've seen has been a prerequisite for international leadership for the past uh, couple of millennia. So I think I'll um, end my remarks there and very much look forward to the discussion. <clears throat> Thank you, Matt. Great. Um, let me... Uh... Uh, something that you didn't uh, probe into as deeply in your remarks, but which is important in the book. I'd like to bring that out and that'll help people to understand your argument, which is that you believe that what, uh, it, it, what makes the prospects for the United States superior to the prospects for China, and then you have those other um, seven, is it other seven or other six, case studies back through history where you develop this argument is institutions. So you hang, so the this, this sort of dependent variable is that in major power competitions, the, the, the democratic republics, and you emphasize republic as the form of demo democracy that you're talking about, have been more successful because of institutions, not because of something else. So I just want to check on what are the institutions and let everybody to you know understand that that you think do this work and um, or, or not so much what are the institutions you're saying they are Republican institutions but what what it, what are the wherein lies the superiority of these institutions and as I read your book I saw three points that you emphasized one was stability so you believe that the autocratic systems are subject to disruptions of system and you know instability and that the the re democratic republican systems although they look messy 
are have continuity of leadership, I think is what you mean by stability. Am I, do I get that correctly? So we are able to have a succession in power, orderly succession, you know, the, what we just have been through. The second one is about innovation, that uh, the open society kind of model is better for innovation. And the third one is the avoidance of error, that although any kind of political system can make a wrong decision, the, the democratic systems are less likely to do so. So am I saying that correctly and am I missing something in, in the substructure of your argument about why democratic systems perform better in competitions? Well, that's a, a good um, summary. And you know, maybe I, I probably should have chatted with you before I uh, wrote the book and I could have expressed that um, even uh, you know, as, as clearly as you just did. Um, yeah, so there are, there are a number of different arguments and I am standing on the shoulders of giants here of other social scientists who have written about democratic advantages. So I think all the ones you mentioned are correct. The other one I, I would mention is the, the checks and balances in a democratic system, which you know often in contemporary debate, we see as evidence of uh, ineffectiveness. We're, we're gridlocked, we're polarized, we can't get anything done. Um, but the, um, you know, some of the recent economics and uh, political science literature says, well, when it comes to um, finance, for example, you know, being gridlocked is a good thing. It means you can't default on loans. It means that investors, therefore, feel more comfortable uh, investing in your system, that you're going to be more likely to, uh, to pay them back. Um, so kind of the credible commitment uh, literature in political science, to use the, the political science jargon. Uh, same thing in alliances, you know, when uh, democracies make um, international commitments, they're more likely to keep them uh, because it's harder for them to, um, to pull out of agreements or to uh, change uh, direction. Whereas a, a dictator can more easily say, I'm your friend today, I'll stab you in the back tomorrow. There's, there aren't the constraints in the system uh, to stop uh, him or her from uh, doing that. Um, so, you know, kind of paradoxical in a way, but basically the, the constraints in the system that many people see as a weakness are, are in a way uh, the greatest strength of, of democracies. Um, and then the, the power balance that you attend to also has three parts, well, the, or has three parts, because now you've added a fourth institutional thing, and that is the economic finance innovation piece. So it kind of tracks to the classic three types of power the economic power, the diplomatic slash soft power, and the military power, right? Yeah. That's right. So that makes a lot of sense. Let me ask um, two questions and then because of time, you know, just go to, so people should raise their hands. You know, in the chat, um, James has pointed out to everybody that um, you should use the raise hand function on the participant menu to get into the, uh, to ask questions of matter to make comments. So but I'd li like to ask one thing. So an alternative theory could be that it's not the institutions, it's something else. And without looking at all of your 14, you know, the seven paired comparisons, if we talk about say China, Russia, that their problems arise from geography and demography and not from institutions. That if, you, if Xi Jinping were to be elected president of the United States and have two oceans on either side and, you know, have developed, you know, a sort of had been able to develop a continent with relatively thin population and, you know, he, he could have run a great system here, but because He's surrounded by enemies and he has a very dense population and he has all these national minorities and all that stuff. He has to be afraid of the domestic stability and he has to be, a, uh, you know, he can't raise his uh, GDP per capita to, you know, 30 or 50,000, you know, and all that. It's G and Russia, this parallel argument. Second question I'll ask, I'll just throw these two questions. Are the policy implications, you know, now we're all talking about what is Biden's China policy and so on. Are the policy implications of your argument any different from the policy implications of the um, authority, what you label the authoritarian advantage argument, the sort of democratic declinist 
argument? Is it, uh, would you have a unique, I mean, so one is tempted to say, oh, Matt has told us everything is cool. We could sort of go back to bed. Don't worry about it. I'm sure you're not. Uh, in fact, I read your last chapter. That's not where you're at. But what? how are the policy uh, implications different, if at all? So that's yes, two um, and then a good question. So first on the um, geography, what I'd say to that is in, in many of the cases in the book, you know, the institutions were set before the geography was set. Uh, you know, the United States was a, uh, a republic in uh, late 1700s, but continued to expand its, its borders uh, after, you know, same with um, the, the Romans, uh, obviously, um, and so uh, the Dutch as well. And so there was a, um, you know, there's this um, line of geopolitical thinking. Colin Gray is, is one of the um, scholars in, in this um, uh, line of uh, thinking who've talked about land powers versus sea powers. Uh, and do sea powers have the advantage or land powers? And um, uh, what I argue in the book is that actually institutions help determine whether a country becomes a, a sea power or a land power, uh, because these countries with more open uh, Republican institutions uh, tend to be more open to foreign ideas, foreign trade, foreign people. Uh, so they tend to become trading powers. And then as they become trading powers, then they need navies to protect their trading routes. And so they become naval powers. Um, whereas um, autocratic countries, you know, don't like a lot of people, ideas, goods flowing across their borders. They like control, so they tend to be more insular and are more likely to develop as um, land powers. Um, so on the geography point, I think it's um, the institutions driving the geography. And, and same thing to some degree with uh, uh, demography. Um, you know, one of the th things I point to as a democratic advantage is that we do tend to be more open to immigration. Uh, and so we have positive brain drains uh, in our favor. And that's not just with the United States. I think many people are familiar with that. But it's interesting how often that theme recurred of Athens being open to uh, merchants and traders and others from throughout the Mediterranean. Um, the, the Romans, you know, allowing conquered people to become um, generals and senators within uh, the Roman state. Um, the Dutch, uh, part of the reason they were able to be uh, so successful is that Jews and others in Spain were persecuted and fled uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, the Dutch Republic. Um, so, I, so I think that um, institutions are kind of a, an underlying important structural variable driving some of these other um, factors in a way that maybe we haven't fully um, considered before and might deserve more study. On, on what is the um, implication for Biden, I, th I think there are you know, as I said, I do think that China and Russia are potentially dangerous. Uh, you know, Russia could decide to invade uh, Estonia, China could decide to invade Taiwan, and we'd be in a major war, uh, you know, possibly by the end of the day. So I don't want to say these, these countries um, aren't dangerous. But I think there are some different implications that come um, from my um, study. You know, I think often in the national security community in Washington, people are very focused on the enemy's strengths and our vulnerabilities. Um, but um, I think good strategy often comes from doing the reverse. Wh where are we strong and where are they vulnerable? And how can we stick it to them there? Uh, and I think that my study identifies some of our enduring strengths, uh, innovation, alliances. Um, uh, and, and I think it also identifies some of the opponent's uh, weaknesses, uh, inability to um, really open their financial systems, inability to build um, alliances, a need to focus on domestic repression over external security. Uh, and so I think as we think of a competitive strategy for Russia and China, you know, th thinking more about our strengths and, and their weaknesses would help us to develop a, a better, uh, better way forward. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a question in chat. I think people should ideally should uh, pose their question. So Leah Diaz has a question in chat, but Leah Diaz, do you want to turn off, uh, open your mic and explain? Put your question. Uh, hello, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you. It's been a wonderful talk. Thank you again. Well, I, I was just fascinated by this topic. Uh, I used to study also at CIFA, uh, and I was working on the transatlantic relationship. I'm now now doing more politics, but anyway, I was very interested in uh, how Professor Kronik he talked about democracy, and he's. I'm I'm not sure whether he said that, but like. Today, it's more about certain countries that have like certain features that are more or less democratic. So that's very interesting because I think traditionally from a, from a theoretical point of view, we have always distinguished the category of 
democracy autocracy so maybe it should be interesting interesting if he wanted to um uh to talk a little bit more about the notion of democracy nowadays and um uh, i'll be very interested in all that you're going to be saying um the panelists uh the professor and of course all the other people participating in the talk thank you again for this kind opportunity should i go ahead um professor yeah, go ahead please go ahead you know, we, we do often talk about democracy and autocracy as kind of binary categories. And, you know, to be fair, that's the, I do the same in the title of the book. Um, but political scientists have often thought about uh, regime type really more on a continuum. Um, so, th and, and there have been a number of efforts to try to measure levels of democracy and levels of autocracy. Uh, perhaps the best well known is the polity scores that political scientists use that uh, rate a country's uh, level of democracy and autocracy on a 20 point scale. You know, so plus 10 is most democratic, um, negative 10 most autocratic, but there are a lot of shades of gray uh, in between. And, and I think that's a, a better way of thinking about it, more as a continuum rather than black and, and white. Um, so to go back to some of the historical cases, as, as I was saying, the, uh, the Roman Republic or the Dutch Republic um, wouldn't count as, um, you know, democracies or I don't know where they would rate on a polity scale if we scored them today, certainly not a positive 10. Um, but they were more open, had more of these features, executive constraints, um, you know, uh, civil liberties that we associate with democracies. Then uh, they're more autocratic uh, competitors who probably would have been closer to that negative uh, 10 part of the uh, spectrum, you know, Xerxes in the Persian Empire, uh, for example. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, I, th I think think about um, the, the continuum rather than black and white as, as it relates to, um, you know, the United States today. So that's a, ver a question I've gotten a lot. You know, are we really a democracy? Um, uh, and um, you know, I, I think there are some challenges to our democracy. We saw it on January 6th, so I'm not um, uh, naive about that. You know, on, on the other hand, compare our institutions to those in Russia and China, and I think there, there's no comparison. We're clearly a more open, democratic um, society. You know, um, Trump and um, Pelosi, you know, tweet at each other and hold hearings and, and other things, whereas you know, we, we see what happens to critics in uh, Russia or China, uh, or sometimes we don't see, but you know, they're they're poisoned or or eliminated, um, uh, imprisoned on corruption charges, uh, and so yes, uh, our system has problems, but um, you know, it, it is still more democratic, more free than uh, our competitors, and I think that uh, that's good in and of itself, but also is good for um, uh, this coming competition. I see Don Kassler's hand is up. Yeah, hi, Professor Nathan and Professor Cronin. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, we do. Okay, great. Um, thanks for this wonderful talk. Super interesting to hear about, hear more about your book. Um, so my question is about kind of the differences or similarities between your argument and conclusions and that of folks like Steve Brooks, Bill Woolforth, Michael Beckley, who I think you say in the book aren't offering as generalizable an argument as you are, but I think are ne nevertheless reaching some of the same conclusions. So I was wondering if you could talk about what you see as kind of the similarities and differences in your work and their work. Good. And I did my um, PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. So your uh, image there of the San Francisco Bay is uh, making me feel like a sucker for leaving California. Um, well, it's literally just to hide my rather hideous background behind me in my apartment. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm glad to provide with you with some uh, uh, sentiment, sentimental feelings. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I, th I think you're right that I am reaching um, some of the same conclusions as Beckley and Brooks and uh, Woolforth. Um, uh, Bob Lieber, uh, Robert Lieber, my uh, colleague at Georgetown who recently retired, has also kind of written about American staying power. Um, so I think we, we reached the same conclusion. The United States is in a stronger position than many people appreciate. It will continue to be uh, the, the system's leader. Um, I think there are, um, are a couple of things that are different about this book. One is I do have this um, simple and I think powerful explanation uh, as to why uh, it, it relates to our institutions. Uh, you know, I often hear in Washington people say, oh, well, our greatest strength is our um, world beating economy in Silicon Valley and our innovation. Or other people will say our greatest strength is our, uh, our uh, system of alliances. Or other people say, no, our, our greatest strength is our superpower military. 
And in a sense, what I'm arguing in this book is that those things are all uh, effects of, of our institutions, that really it's our institutions that are the primary uh, source of our power. And that's what leads to our innovative economy, to our network of alliances and to uh, our effective uh, military. So I think that's um, one difference that, that there's kind of a clearer um, explanation for why the United States is in a strong position. Uh, and then also there's the um, uh, historical uh, comparison, looking at how these more democratic countries have done, you know, from uh, 2,500 years ago to the present, whereas Beckley and some of the others, you know, do very good work on the U.S. and China today, but uh, don't put it in as broad a historical uh, pers uh, perspective. Thank you. Sorry, I, I, un I mute myself in between and then I can't find the unmute. I, I don't see any other hand hey. raised. Is there another hand raised? Our co-hosts have questions. So uh, James okay. or Ray, do you want to unmute? You, they don't. They can't raise their hand because they're co-hosts. Oh, okay. Yeah. Please go ahead. Sure. Um, I can. I can lead off here for for a quick second. One of the things that I I wanted to to harken back to, Professor Koenig, was your comment on uh, the on Russia's shortcomings as a as a great power claimant. Um, and I just wanted to know if, if you could briefly elaborate on that in the in context of nuclear weaponry, um, because whereas we don't consider Russia a, a great power competitor in regards to its economy or its institutions or any other of those facets, I don't think there's anyone who would who would challenge necessarily the Russian military as a peer, if if not necessarily. A, a, I, I hope I made that clear. <laughs> Yeah, um, good question. And, and I do have a uh, part of the Russia chapter where I say, you know, does Russia even belong in a book on great power rivalry? Is Russia a great power? And I ultimately conclude uh, that, that it is a great power for a variety of reasons. It's, you know, a continental sized power. Um, it's one of only five countries with a veto in the UN Security Council. Um, it, it does have um, uh, really a decisive influence over countries and it's near abroad. It prevented Georgia and Ukraine from joining um, NATO, for example. Um, and um, as you point out, it's the, um, you know, probably the only country uh, on earth that can destroy the United States and, uh, you know, before this talk uh, is over. Um, and, you know, historically, Russia uh, has always been a great power. It's always been a relatively weak uh, great power among the European great powers, but it's always been a great power. It's it's the Russian Federation's father was a superpower. So I think for a lot of reasons, it, it is projecting military power in other regions, including in, in the Middle East. So I think it is a great power. It's just like it has been historically a relatively weak, um, great power. Uh, you know, economically, it's going to be in no position to be a peer to the United States uh, anytime soon, if, if ever. You know, diplomatically, um, it, it's, it's not a great power. It doesn't have a lot of uh, friends uh, in the world. Um, militarily is really the um, only place where it's um, punching, uh, punching above its weight. And so I don't want to, uh, again, downplay the threat from either Russia or China. I, I think there uh, is a real threat. We saw it in the 2016 election interference. We saw it with the invasion of uh, Ukraine and Georgia. Um, so I, I do, um, you know, uh, think these countries pose a potential challenge to the United States and its allies. Um, but if you're talking about, you know, a real peer competitor, a country that could maybe one day overtake the United States as the international system's leader. Uh, you know, China, I think, deserves to be in that conversation. Russia uh, probably does not. Somebody else? Another one, <laughs> Professor Professor Kronig, Professor uh, uh, Nathan, thank you so much for, um, for this call today. Um, my name is Ray Harris. I am uh, also one of the graduate, uh, recent grads of uh, SIPA. Uh, and my question is, uh, so if, I, I personally have not read your book, but um, considering that, you know, the recent transition, you know, we, this week we had the Biden administration come back uh, on, uh, come on board on uh, inauguration day uh, and uh, signaling with uh, uh, his uh, uh, picking uh, uh, Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, and also uh, Secretary of State, uh, I guess now Secretary of State, uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Lloyd Austin, um, would do you do you see more of a, a, a strategic shift back to uh, the the Asia Pacific as a uh, as as part of uh, U.S. foreign policy, and also um, 
given the events of the last four years where uh, the previous administration had uh, really just, you know, taken a, uh, a bat to, uh, you know, liberal institutions, do you see how, how can the uh, Biden administration uh, help to repair those uh, traditional alliances and partners? Thank you. Yeah, good questions. Um, so I, I guess a couple of points, and um, you know, Professor Nathan knows this um, well, but um, you know, really after the end of the, the Cold War, um, maybe even before, the United States had this um, uh, hope that by uh, engaging with China, uh, that China would become a responsible stakeholder uh, in a rules-based international system. And so I think that was the approach that was still guiding the Obama administration uh, to a large degree. And then uh, we had this big shift with the Trump administration coming in in 2017, uh, declaring the return of great power competition, the uh, foremost threat to the United States. And, and while the document said Russia and China, um, you know, you didn't have to scratch the surface much to see that really the concern was China. Uh, I think Mark Esper, former Secretary of Defense, even said something like, uh, I have three priorities. Uh, number one is China, number two is China, and number three is China. And so there was a question of, is um, this going to um, uh, continue uh, or not? Was this just uh, something with the Trump administration or will the Biden administration continue with this um, you know, more competitive approach? And, and I think overall it will continue with this more competitive approach. Um, and a couple of data points on that. Um, Kurt Campbell and Eli Ratner, both of whom are going to go into uh, positions of responsibility in the Biden administration, uh, wrote a foreign affairs article a couple of years ago that basically said the approach of the past several decades hasn't worked, um, that uh, our, our hope to engage with China to make it a responsible stakeholder hasn't worked, and it's time for a tougher approach. And I thought it was really remarkable in Blinken's um, testimony the other day, um, you know, the Trump administration declared China's actions in Xinjiang uh, to be genocide, and um, Lindsey Graham, Senator Lindsey Graham, asked um, Tony Blinken about this, and Blinken said that would be my uh, judgment as well. Uh, so I think those things signal that this more competitive um, approach with China will continue. Um, on the other hand, I think the Biden approach will be somewhat different than the Trump approach in, in I think, two ways. Um, one, uh, I think there is more of a, a focus on not doing this alone, not just the United States and China duking it out, but having a coordinated strategy with our allies. Um, and I think that makes good sense for, for hard power reasons. You know, if you look at uh, recent GDP numbers, um, real GDP share of global GDP, the United States is something like 22 or 23 percent of global GDP. China is something like 16 percent. So we still have an advantage, but it's getting close. Um, as I said before, if you bring in formal U.S. treaty allies, we have 59 percent of global GDP. Uh, so 59, our 59 against China's 16. Uh, it puts us in a better place. If you bring in other democracies, it's 75% of global GDP uh, against China's 16%. So I think coordinating a, an approach with our allies to deal with China uh, makes a lot of sense. You know, just one example is the, the trade dispute. Um, if it's the United States, the European Union, and Japan on one side of the table with a unified position, China on the other side of the table uh, will be in a stronger position um, in those negotiations. Um, oh, Matt, the other, the other thing that will be um, different is um, I, I think the Biden administration recognizes that we still want to try to engage with China uh, where that makes sense. It's not all competitive. And there are areas like arms control, nonproliferation, climate change, food security, other areas where um, even as we have a, a competitive relationship, uh, we can still um, cooperate uh, with China. Uh, and I would argue that the, you know, the goal isn't to compete um, forever. It's not to fight World War III. Um, ideally, we would like a more uh, cooperative relationship with China at some point. Uh, and so I think in, uh, continuing to have dialogue and uh, engagement tracks uh, will be important for getting the relationship uh, in a more cooperative place. And you know, who, who knows how long that will take? Maybe it's after President Xi leaves office. Maybe it's a generation from now. Uh, but I think the goal should be a more co uh, cooperative uh, relationship, not continual um, competition. I got Matt it. Bratton is next. Or, oh, Matt. Okay, Matt Bratton. Uh, hello, Professor Nathan, Professor Kronick. Thank you for uh, doing this. And so I have well has not read your book, but I was going up something you said earlier about the cooperation on climate change in an article I read recently in Brookings. 
talking about with Biden's kind of selection of John Kerry on kind of climate change issues and his policy towards China being a one of a lot of cooperation and whatnot. Uh, what's your take on this article specifically mentioned that some people in the administration are a little bit conflicted over whether or not because of his stance toward China that we may have a little bit of over cooperation and in the end kind of utilize some political capital and take concessions from the Chinese in ways that really hurt the relative power between ourselves and China. Yeah, um, well, and if, if you're, I should uh, say, if you're interested in my views on um, strategy for China, I did publish a report with the Atlantic Council uh, think tank where I have an affiliation at the end of last year called um, an allied strategy for China. Uh, and that, that was a 30,000 word report. So basically half a book, pretty uh, substantial. But I called for a three track um, strategy. Um, track number one is, is strengthening ourselves uh, and our alliances and the rules based system for a new era of competition. Uh, track two is uh, defending uh, against the challenges posed by China and the economic governance and military um, domains and, and imposing cost on China when it violates widely held um, international standards. Uh, and then track three is, is the engagement piece. Um, so I think uh, you can compete and, and engage um, at the same time. I, I don't think you have to choose. And I think there's um, examples of that um, historically. You know, if you look at the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union competed in many areas, but we cooperated on the Non-Proliferation Treaty and, and other things. Um, so um, I, I think we should have the more competitive tracks in DOD and elsewhere, uh, even as Kerry tries to in, engage on climate change. And so I think it uh, will come down to a matter of priorities uh, at some point. Um, you know, if the Chinese are asking for concessions for uh, in certain areas for cooperation on climate change, then uh, we'll have to make a strategic um, decision. Um, I guess my sense is that in general, it is time for a more uh, competitive um, approach that uh, trying to kind of cooperate for its own sake in the past um, hasn't really worked. And I, I think that, um, you know, essentially our, our strategy will be successful if we convince uh, President Xi or the people around him or the people who come uh, a generation from now uh, that this more competitive approach um, hasn't worked, uh, that it's been too difficult, too costly to compete with the United States and its allies. Uh, that Beijing's own interest would be better served with a more cooperative approach. And so it's for, for that reason that I think we need to lean a little bit harder on the competition track uh, now and a little bit less on, on the engagement track. I got to ask two follow-up questions to the, to the series of questions that you, answers that you just gave. So the first one is that, um, as I said in your bio, that you have been a foreign policy advisor to three Republican presidential campaigns. And the one that caught my eye is Rubio because Rubio is keenly interested in China. Um, and you believe that one of the strengths of a democracy is, is, you know, checks and balances and, well, you didn't say this, but I assume you mean the two party system. In the, and the Republican party is split, right? So we have the Pompeo group and so forth, but within the, what may I call it, mainstream, I hope, part of the Republican Party. What, oh, you, you've described the Biden China policy in a way that's, that you seem to take a very affirmative attitude. It sounds to me like your 30,000 word paper is the same as the Kurt Campbell policy. What alternative to the Biden China policy might we expect to see emerging among responsible Republican leaders like Rubio? Maybe more emphasis on human rights, for example. He has put a lot of emphasis on that, but, um, but it looks like the Biden administration will also do that. The second follow-up question that's related to this is, in your, I agree with the things you said, the three legs of a China policy and so on. But from your lessons of history, where does a thing like this end? Um, some of the cases you've talked about, you know, the bad guy collapses. Uh, but um, I can't imagine that that's going to happen with China. China's going to be there. Uh, 
uh, some people say, well, let's find China's legitimate interests and work with them. But Ch Taiwan, for example, is absolutely China's legitimate interest. But at the same time, it's it's a fundamental, I think you agree, national interest of the United States. There is no compromise over Taiwan. Somebody's going to lose. So where, where do you think, does this end up in a balance of power? You, you suggested it ends up with Xi or his successor kind of understanding that what they have to give up? Because I don't think they want to give, I don't think China will ever give up. It's been there for thousands of years and it's going to continue to be there for thousands of years. So what is the strategic target toward which we are aiming and what do the Republicans think about that? Well, let me answer your, um... Uh, for, uh, last question first, and because this was an interest of mine uh, as well after the 2017 national security strategy was published. You know, we say the uh, priority is great power competition, and me and, and others said, well, you know, competition is, is not a goal. Like, you know, what, what does success look like? And so I asked, being in Washington, I'm uh, able to, um, you know, uh, go to meetings. And so I was able to ask several senior Trump administration officials, what is the goal of, of this competition? And um, I, I didn't get any really coherent answers or consistent answers. Uh, so one uh, person said, well, the goal is, you know, there, there is no goal. There's always been competition. There will always be competition. We just have to compete. Um, and I, I don't think that's a good answer. Another one said, um, well, the goal is to compete while avoiding a, a major war. And I said, OK, so if we avoid a major war, but, um, you know, China spreads autocracy around the world, undermines American alliances and uh, East Asia, the United States becomes, um, you know, a smaller power. Is that success? And he said, no, you're right. I'm going to have to think about that more. So I, I think a lot of people have, it's, a, it's the right question. I think a lot of people haven't answered it. Um, so, um, you know, it, it seems like the, the, there are different answers I could come up with. You know, one is we give China a sphere of influence and maybe they're satisfied with that, but I don't think that's in the U.S. interest. You know, we don't want to sell out our allies in Asia. You know, um, World War III is a possible end state. We fight it out. But I, I, I think that's not what we want. So I think the desired end state is that we and China have a more cooperative relationship, stable relationship uh, in the long term. So the question is then, how do we get there? And, um, you know, you're, you're the expert, so I'd be interested in your views. But, but the only thing I can imagine is that, um, you know, if we do compete and it doesn't go as well as President Xi's imagining right now and the people around him, or the next generation of Chinese leaders, whether CCP or, or not uh, CCP, say, you, you know, this, this hasn't really worked for China. We're better off going back to, you know, something like the Hu Jintao policy, something like a hide and bide policy. Um, I, I think that would be an acceptable outcome for uh, the United States. So a China that's not, um, you know, as assertive and threatening its neighbors, a China that's um, um, doing a better job of uh, abiding by international um, uh, trading rules. Um, uh, I guess I would consider that a, a successful um, outcome. And, and uh, logically, anyway, that's the only way I can see us getting there is by convincing uh, Chinese leadership that this more assertive approach of Xi uh, has been counterproductive. Um, uh, with the future of the Republican Party, I actually wrote a piece in National Review just a couple of days ago uh, on this, and I can um, send it over. Um, and, and I basically argue that, you know, there's this narrative that um, the Republican Party is going to become Trumpist, it's going to become isolationist, uh, and I basically push back against that uh, in this piece. Um, but, but as it relates to China, you know, what's interesting within the Republican Party is that you do have this lineage of kind of realist thinkers going all the way back to Henry Kissinger. You know, Kissinger, Scowcroft, um, Steve Hadley, um, and Bob Gates, I think currently I'd put in that uh, camp and, and I think they're they're afraid that we're going too far in the competition with China. That China is a great power. Uh, we need to have stable relations. Uh, we should, um, you know, be trying to uh, to manage uh, this competition, put guardrails around it. And then I do think you have others, uh, maybe Rubio or uh, others, who who are harder line on China, including on human rights and other things. And while they they don't say it out loud, maybe their preference would be that the CCP um, comes to an end uh, at some point. So I think that's the main divide you'll have within the Republican Party, the more realist types versus the, uh, the harder line types. <clears throat> that's very interesting. Um, do we have any other hand up? Because we are at the end of the hour. 
So uh, Ray Ray uh, appears to have a hand up. Okay, thank you. No, no, thank you so much uh, for those responses. Those are uh, uh, great answers. Uh, I, I uh, my question is, uh, you know, given so we you brief, Professor Granig, you, you also uh, discussed briefly about international trade um, with uh, the U.S. like reentering, you know, engaging in the inter international institutions. Uh, the World Trade Organization has been in turmoil because of uh, the uh, dispute settlement unit has been having, uh, like they haven't been able to fill the uh, dispute, uh, I, I can't remember what you call it, those appellate judges or so there. And how do you see the US and China uh, trying to come to some kind of understanding uh, in, in, in terms of uh, that relationship? Thanks. Well, good. And this, this is a good um, question to end on, too, because, um, you know, there's this, um, you know, part of this autocratic advantage kind of theory that I hear around Washington is that China plans for the long term. You know, uh, she can plan decades ahead, 2049. You know, meanwhile, we're focused on the next election. We can't do long term strategy. Uh, and I argue that I think that's um, incorrect. If you look at China's history, there is a lot of bouncing around on uh, strategy. Um, you know, under Mao Zedong is the best example of this with Great Leap Forward, Cultural Revolution, <clears throat> jumping from one um, big uh, strategy to another. Uh, but if you look at the United States, I, I argue we've, we've basically had the same grand strategy for uh, 70 years of kind of uh, creating um, uh, and defending this, this rules-based international system. And so I conclude in the book by saying we sh this has been a strategy that's worked for us. Uh, we should continue it. Uh, you have some people saying, well, well, the system's dead. We need to throw it out the window. Um, you have others, I think, who think that Biden can just go back to the old playbook. Um, but, but I think neither of those are quite right. The world has changed since 1945 when the system was first established, 1991 when it was really deepened. Uh, so I think we need to revitalize and adapt this system for a, a new era. So I think pulling out of um, the WHO, as Trump did, pulling out of the WTO, as some uh, suggested, including Senator Hawley, I think that would be a mistake. Uh, we, we help to build these institutions. Uh, I, I do think they need reform, but uh, we're in a better position to do that from uh, within. So uh, we, we uh, uh, in, in a sense, I think these institutions will become a, a, one of the arenas for this great power competition. We've seen China gain influence within the WHO. Uh, Biden has just announced his intention to return. And so I think we need to uh, reassert uh, the authority of the United States uh, and its democratic allies uh, within these multilateral institutions that that we built. Well, well, Matt, thank you very, very much for a wonderful presentation. Thanks to all the participants. And I guess we can sign off now. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Professor Nathan. And uh, it's been a real pleasure. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Ingrid. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.